So I want to ask a question. What is there that influences God when he engages with us? And is there a principle that is rarely preached in church and perhaps we don't fully understand? So um, many of you will know I have a a family. I have uh, two children and one wife and I have two granddaughters. And um, when uh, we were younger, we had our two little boys that are now older. This is Joel and Levi. They were super cute when they were young. Um, Levi was uh, a little bit, he was just like the creative arty one. He loves music. We still talk. He sends me his songs. Every few weeks I get a new song from him. It's really cool. Uh, Joel, on the other hand, was a bit more of a kind of a boyish sports, cars, motorbikes, that kind of thing again um, sometimes you know I wondered (laughs) what was really going on with him you know so imagine uh, one day uh, somebody comes up to me and says let's imagine Brandon just met Brandon and uh, at the end of the the week Brandon comes up to me and says Paul I um, I really love the teaching thinking of getting the books absolutely amazing incredible never heard teaching like it however I think your wife's ugly and your kids are brats But me and you, Paul, we could have a great relationship. Me and you, we could have a great relationship. Give me a hug. He's going to get a physical response, isn't he? He's not going to get the physical response he's expecting. He's going to get a punch on the nose, uh, but he's going to get a physical response. And it's ridiculous, and we smile and we laugh, but that's what we do with God. I love you, Father, but I don't like the church. And you hear it now, don't you? You hear people, well, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. We have no idea what Jesus thinks about that. We're completely, it seems, ignorant of the fact that when we love Jesus, we have to love the church. Whether it's an institution we don't like, whether it's the organization we don't like, makes no difference. The church is Christ's bride. To say to Jesus, I love you, but I don't like the church, is like Brandon saying to me, I like you, but I don't like your wife. I love you, but I don't like the one that you love. Matthew uh, 25, verse 37 to 40 says this, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit with you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Here's one of the problems we have with our religion, it seems to me, is essentially we've individualized our religion, we've individualized Christianity, and we've also individualized our relationship with Christ. You even hear it in Worship services, the worship leader will get up and say, hey, forget about everybody else around you and just focus on Jesus. Well, if you do that, what's the point of coming to church? Do that at home. That's the last thing we should be doing. When we come to church, the whole point of church is bringing our praise. The whole point of our church is coming to encourage each other in the things of God. The idea of shutting everybody out and just focusing on Jesus will do that when you go to the lavatory. Do that when you're alone at home. Do that on your own, but don't do that at church. So I can't find anywhere in the Bible, it seems to me at least, where it says you go to church to receive something. At least I can't find it. You might and you can show me afterwards. I don't want to preach something that's not true. Every time I see church mentioned in the Bible, it's the place you go to take something. You bring a psalm, you bring a word of encouragement, you bring your gifts for the poor. And yet we've individualized our faith so much, we've made it so much about us and what we get. Oh, I really like this preacher. I really like this style of worship. And we're just totally disengaged, I think, when we say that kind of stuff, from what Jesus thinks about his bride the people that belong to him. So I want to undercover this, uh, kind of go through this a little bit more and just see what the Bible says. The Bible says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Um, How I treat you is incredibly important to Jesus. 
I can, be, I can know my Bible, I can pray long prayers, I can pray and fast, but what's most important to him is how I treat you and vice versa as well. Uh, another way of putting it, I kind of put it like a little uh, um, sentence would be this, our commitment to Christ is seen by Christ through our commitment to the body of Christ. Our commitment to Christ is seen by Christ through our commitment to the body of Christ. When I break a promise to you, am I not breaking a promise to God? These things are connected together. And if we're looking for God's blessing in our lives, we need to understand this kingdom principle. If we're going to advance the kingdom of God, we certainly need to understand this principle. So what does the the principle actually look like? What did Jesus tell us? Do not judge, or in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Um, The literal Greek version um, says, for with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. An even more staggering statement that Jesus said, which I don't often hear preached in church, but maybe you do, is what he said in Matthew 6, verse 14. God forgives those who forgive others. The implication being what? If you don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive you. So I really want to emphasize, just at the beginning, before we get practical, just how important this is to God. Just how vital. This is the religion that is important to him. More than our Bible knowledge, more than all these other things. Now, the crazy thing, of course, is we're supposed to judge. The Bible is full of advice of how to judge people. The Bible is full of advice of situations and scenarios we should be in. It tells us to avoid certain people. So what's going on here? Isn't there a confliction? The Bible's full of advice about judgments, including judgments of people. And at the same time, you've got Jesus saying things like, in the same way you judge others, you know, you will be judged. So what's going on? Well, it's all about Kavanaugh, isn't it? It all comes down to the direction of our heart. Why are we judging other people? What is the purpose of our judgment? If you remember, we have uh, Kavanaugh, and Kavanaugh means to direct the heart and awareness of God's presence and purpose for what we do. So as we judge people, where is that judgment uh, coming from? Uh, We need to be careful of who influences us. The Bible says, uh, bad company corrupts good character. So we have to make a judgment about that. I would encourage you to surround yourself with people who are going to encourage you to advance the kingdom of God and be the best kind of person you can be. It doesn't mean we don't meet or are not friends with other people, but give most space in your life to people who are going to help you be the person you want to be. That's not a bad thing. That's having awareness of God's presence and purpose in your heart. Does that make sense? Um, It's my job to judge people. It's a big part of my job is to make judgments. It's it's, um, uh, Drea and the Foxy Lynn's job uh, and Elise's job and now Danny and Alison's job to judge whether people should be here on pays or not. And we have a moral ethical and biblical responsibility to do that some people there are empty seats here some people could have been on those seats but we decided not to accept them so why well i believe that we did that with cabinet we did that for the purpose of the kingdom of god we didn't want to put people with young people if we felt they weren't going to be good examples or if we felt they were going to be a little bit flaky and preach the gospel to them but halfway through the year give up because that always causes a lot of damage to young people. So I don't want you to get, I think we said this the other day, I want you to be intentional, but not intense. We have to make decisions. We have to make judgments. Corban, if you remember, is an absolving of our selfishness or a hiding of our selfishness in spirituality. So this is when we maybe judge people because we, want to feel superior to them or we just feel superior to them we want to put them down maybe we judge people because we want to divert attention from our own sin isn't that what happened in genesis you know where we were well diverting attention it wasn't me it was their fault 
Um, it might be because of our own insecurities and hurt. There's an old adage that says, hurt people, hurt people. Um, I think you see that, especially right now in our polarized society. There's a lot of people who are, who are really hurt and they're very prickly. You notice that, like everything, you don't even have to say something and things that I could have said years ago, made jokes about, you can't say anything like that. People are so prickly. People are so easily looking, hoping almost, it seems to me, to be offended. Because if they're offended, maybe that's going to excuse the way they behave, perhaps. I don't know what's behind that. I often think of it a bit like a kebab. I know I shouldn't mention kebabs on the day of prayer and fasting, but kebab, you know where you have this stick and you have pieces of meat? So some people, you can tell people feel like they're being stabbed in the back because the same knife's pointing out and everywhere they go, it's ouch, ouch, ouch. I just don't believe God wants us to be like that. He doesn't want us to be easily offended. He wants us to show grace and mercy. Um, so having that sense of kavanah because... I think it's an Indian proverb that said, when bull elephants fight, the grass always loses. You know, when people in church fight together, it's the lost that lose out. When team members and team leaders, and we don't often hear this, but if they fight together, it's the young people that lose out. It's hard to build anything in a time of war. You build things in a time of peace generally. Because in a time of war, all your resources, your time, your energy are put into the fight. It was Solomon who built, not David. David fought, Solomon built in a time of peace. So can we judge? Absolutely. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the wrong kind of judgment for the wrong reason. So what does this look like when we talk about the cloud and the line? Maybe just to help you understand a little bit about, because sometimes the things in the Bible just don't make sense. For instance, um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Does that not sound harsh to you? So we have to understand the context. In the Old Testament, basically people took revenge. So let's say, um, uh, I don't know, let's say me and Andrew uh, have a fight, okay? And um, in that fight, Andrew blinds me. So then my brothers or my family go out and they kill him. Slight overreaction. That's revenge. They take revenge. So what happens is, and that's the, that's the context that was going on in the time of Moses. So God gives Moses a different law, and he moves from revenge to justice. And he says, no, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That looks harsh now, but in those days, what he was doing was limiting revenge. In other words, if uh, I, so if Andrew blinds me, then either my brothers are allowed to blind him, but more often what that meant was there was some kind of financial restitution. There was a limited response. It was, it was limiting revenge. So looking back, it looks harsh. At the time, I think even Moses said, I think, isn't it amazing the wonderful laws that God has given us so different from the rest of the world? But then Jesus comes and Jesus says, absolutely, God is a God of justice, but come closer. If you really want to know what's in God's heart, it's not justice, it's grace. It's grace, and we'll look at grace in a few moments. So, when we look at this from a Christian-centric perspective, line dwellers would ask these kind of questions. They would ask questions like, how much should I forgive? And why should I forgive? And what should I forgive? I wrote this in the book. We struggle with this kingdom principle perhaps more than any other. We bring out our stories of what was done to us. We work out what we did and we work out the way they did and what they did and we work to compare them. We work out who is right. We work out who is wrong and we work out whether we should forgive and we work out what we are entitled to begrudge. It's a lot of work. Is a calculator really what God had in mind? Is Jesus correct? If Jesus is correct, the Father is not in heaven, meticulously moving beads back and forward on some kind of ancient abacus. He's not adding up our misdemeanors and comparing them with the sins of others. He's not interested in comparing us with each other, but rather in connecting us with each other. 
So we might, if we're Christian-centric, ask these questions, living on the line, well, they did this, so what can I do? How much should I forgive? Even Jesus was asked the question by his disciples, how often should I forgive my brother? It's a line-dwelling question. A kingdom-centric question would be, or would the questions that God asks us would be, will you take the plank out of your own eye first? Will you compare yourself to me, not to them? Will you be the first to drop the stone, not the first to throw it? These are the questions that God are asking you. And I want to get really practical in a moment. Our DNA, therefore, on pages, we only compare ourselves to Jesus. We encourage you, only compare yourself to Jesus. The only person you compare yourself to is Jesus. The only person you should compete against is yourself. And secondly, we celebrate the success of others. The Bible talks about that, celebrating, not being jealous, but celebrating the success of others. That's how you can proactively discipline yourself. When something good happens to someone else and it's not happened to you, don't just try and think to yourself, well, I mustn't be jealous, I mustn't be jealous. The best way of not being jealous is by celebrating their success, sending them a text, saying something to them on Facebook, wherever it might be, you know, reposting that, saying, hey, that's wonderful, send them a message, celebrate with them their success. Even if you know they would never celebrate yours. So let me look at the promises. What do promises come with this kingdom principle? Well, first, judge with grace, and he will claim you as his own. Judge with grace, and he will claim you as his own. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus will claim you. He will not be ashamed of you. He will say, absolutely, they are my children because they love one another. The question is, what is love? What is love? Uh, many years ago, I worked in a, a retail store and one day we had 220 books. They were called Mills and Boone books. I think the nearest thing in America is Harlequin. Basically, it's these love stories. And uh, they have all these different titles. And, and I was there and all the girls at the time he used to read his books. So I'm going to have a look through these books. I had a look through them. I read some of the titles of some of the books. Uh, the Millionaire's Misbehaving Mistress. The Untamed Shake. Blackmailed into the Greek tycoon's bed. Virgin for the billionaire's taking. Snowed in with the boss. The Foxy Lynn and the Naughty Vicar. <laughs> I'm making that one up, uh, just so you understand. But I'm not making up most of those titles, they're real. So I had all these crazy stories, but the reality was, as I looked through them, it was, it, was, it was always the same story. There was some girl, okay, let's call her Jezebel or Elise, okay? There was some kind of girl. <laughs> There was some kind of girl, okay, and she was, she was very fragile, well, not fragile, she was, she was feminine, but she was her own woman, okay? <laughs> and then there'd be, there'd be Bruce, or Dan, or Bert, and he was a beast, oh, he was a beast. They wouldn't like each other, she wouldn't like him, he treated her badly, and about page 98, all right, there would be the incidents, they're on a train, and suddenly the train stops, and Bruce falls into Jezebel, and Jezebel falls into Bruce, and he wraps his arms around her, and she resists, but she just can't, and he kisses her. Or she falls off a, a horse, and he holds her, he can't. she resists, but she just can't. It's the same stupid story. I went to her, I said, this is, it's all, it's the same, oh yeah, but no, it's wonderful. I'm like, it's not love though, is it? So there are different types of love. You know, that's what's called eros love in the Greek. Eros, eros love basically says, I love you because you make me feel good. You give me the, <laughs> you make me feel good. And while you make me feel, I will continue to love you. But if you stop making me feel, maybe I won't. Then you've got philia love, which is a brotherly, a sisterly uh, kind of love, which says, I love you because together we're good. And while we're good, together, while this is working, I will continue to love you. And then there's agape love, a godly, a divine love. 
What's different about that love? That love says this. I love you because I'm loved by God. And so are you. And because that's never going to change, because God will always love me, because God is always love, I will always love you. So I will always, in every situation, as best as I can, I will seek to show God's love to you. Personally, I might not, I might not like you. You know, we just wrote this uh, whole thing called the shapes test. And one of the main emphasis of the shapes test is encouraging people not to mistake a personality trait for a character trait. So if we were all friends, I spent time with you, there'd be some of you I'd like more than others, yeah? Uh, and you'd like other people more than me because we have different personalities. But our personality is not our character. Our personality is amoral. It's, it doesn't make us good or bad. If you're loud, you're quiet, you're funny, you're not funny. It doesn't make you a bad or good person. Our character is moral. Our character is whether we're faithful or unfaithful, whether we're kind or hateful. So don't misjudge a, a personality trait for a character trait. Be prepared to love everyone, even though, yeah, some people may, you may not like them, and that's absolutely fine. It, it takes lots of people to make the world go round. So, number two, judge with grace, and he will have your back. Judge with grace, and he will have you back, your back. Psalm 135, verse 14 says, For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. You don't have to fight those people because God's going to do it for you. Um, there's an interesting misunderstanding about a verse uh, that Jesus uh, shared with us. I'll read the verse out and I'll explain. Let me ask you a question because hopefully as in have room now you're beginning to understand that sometimes what seems insignificant in a verse or a passage is actually the key to its meaning um, because it's all about who's going to look, who's going to study, who's going to lean forward. So Jesus says this, you've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. What seems insignificant about that? What seems like a, just an FYI? What seems like just a bit of added colour? Because quite often those things are key. So why does he say right cheek? Why does he say somebody just slaps you on the cheek? Why say right cheek? Because generally speaking, if you slap someone on the right cheek, you're not punching them, you're not hitting them, you're doing this. He's talking about an insult. He's not talking about... What Jesus is not saying is don't defend yourself. You know, if somebody breaks into my house and tries to kill Lynn or hurt Lynn, it's my responsibility as a husband to protect her. I'm going to kick the life out of somebody if they try and hurt Lynn. And I, I think God would want me to do that. Um, we are going to the detail of this and all the, the language of it. What it's basically saying is, what Jesus is saying is, don't defend yourself the way you're attacked by an evil person. If you're attacked with politics, if people are just political and attack you, defend yourself with prayer. If people attack you with gossip, speak words of grace. If people try and manipulate you or manipulate others, if people spread gossip and slander about you, respond differently to how that happens. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. I've seen that happen in my life. And I'll be really honest with you, I'm not going to tell you any details. It's frightened me at times. There have been times where I feel like I've been pursuing God and the things we've been doing have been advancing the kingdom of God and people have come against us. We've defended ourselves with grace, but then God has done things that have frightened life out of me. Uh, and I've seen God vindicates and it scares me this is very real to me I've seen this happen and I think we underestimate just how much God has our back 
if we respond the way he would want us to respond and we don't respond to ourselves. It's a bit like we said in Seek First, it just occurred to me now, is that, you know, you can go out and defend yourself, but you're going to have to maintain the way you do that. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to do the politics. You're going to have to say the right things to the right people and get the right people on your side. Whereas if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, if you're operating in a godly manner, God's just going to take care of that for you. And people would judge you because they don't really know what's going on in your heart. People see what you do, but they often put their motives for doing what you do on you. Does that make sense? So you do something, and I think, well, the reason I would do that is because of this. And if they're maybe not the nicest person, they're going to think you're doing it for the reason they would do it. But you might be doing it for a godly reason. Don't come out and argue and defend yourself. Answer questions if you're asked. Allow God to vindicate you. Allow God to show who you really are. Judge with grace, and you'll not simply maintain the kingdom, you will advance it. Let me just read Luke uh, chapter 22, verse, I think it's 49 to you. When Lord was around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? So the story is, this is in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the disciples are with Jesus and the soldiers are coming to take Jesus away because Judas has betrayed Jesus. And so the disciples say, should we defend you with a sword? Don't forget it was Jesus who told them to take a sword with them. Remember? And one of them struck the servants of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit me this. And he touched the, his ear and healed him. What's going on there? What's the significance of that? On the surface, you think, great, okay, so one of his disciples hurt the man, so Jesus wanted to heal the man. Jesus did a lot more than simply healing the man. What Jesus did was he restored the man. This guy um, served the priest. Um, what you have to understand about those days, if you had anything wrong with you, like something wrong with your earlobe, you couldn't function. You couldn't be a servant in that setting. So when his right ear got took away, basically he was, he was suddenly unable to then serve God. Does that make sense? Because he wouldn't be allowed, you couldn't have anybody with a deformity like that serving God in the temple. So when Jesus, when Jesus, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't simply forgive, he restores him back to service. And what God is trying to do is try to restore us. And we'll talk about this in another kingdom principle. The one thing the devil is trying to do through sin is not simply destroy your life. He's trying to make you feel you can't serve God anymore. I had a conversation with a, a great leader recently who had some kind of sin in his life. But what he felt was it disqualified him from serving God. And I don't think it does. So my little illustration uh, for this, I'm going to ask Mark just to come uh, out if he doesn't mind and just, uh, just hold this in the air for me, please. Sorry, let's go for the podcast. So we've got God and we've got man. As if you can lift that high, Mark, I'd really appreciate it. Just want to know, it's a real simple thing. Just want you, uh, just to, if you could just lift it higher, that'd be great. Just want you to just uh, observe something very practical that I think has a spiritual um, significance. So for instance, You've got man, so you've got God, and you've got man. Now, people will say things like, I don't like this expression, they'll say things like, when you sin, it cuts off your relationship with God. I don't think it does. God still loves you. God still has a relationship with you. But what it does do is it, does, it can impact your relationship with God. You can feel further away from God. You can feel separated from God. I don't think you are further away from God. God's everywhere. But then you ask for forgiveness, and God forgives you. So let's, let's just imagine this is God forgiving you. And you're back following Jesus. God has forgiven you your sin. What do you notice? It's closer. Now, I felt like that in my life. There have been times when I've sinned, asked God for forgiveness, and it may just be a feeling, but I feel closer to God afterwards. And I think for me, it's a symbol of the fact that God doesn't simply forgive, he restores. 
he brings us back. There's a, a verse in the Bible that says that um, God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. So I, I went away from God for three years, but when I came back to God, it was like everything was back to normal straight away. I didn't have to do three years of getting right with God. Does that make sense? The question is, do we do this? If this is your name, and this is the person who sinned against you, going back to the question we were asked early on, are you simply forgiving people, or are you restoring people? Uh, I'm going to forgive them, but I'm not going to speak to them. Or are you restoring people? If it's genuine repentance, I'm talking about people honestly ask for your forgiveness, are you prepared to restore them back to that position? Thank you, Mark. That will advance the kingdom of God. When, when people see Christians doing that kind of thing, that will advance the kingdom of God. Jesus said, by this, all men will know you are my disciples. So the last promise, and I want to bring a little bit of a, a challenge to you, is judge me grace and you will never outgrace God. Can I just give you one practical tip about forgiveness that I think has stopped people forgiving people? Just some information. When you forgive someone, you're not saying that what they did was right or okay. When you're forgiving someone, you're saying, you did something wrong, but I forgive you. And I know this just through pastoral work, that some people will say, I can't forgive them because what they did was wrong. And in their mind, they're thinking, if I forgive that person, it's like I'm saying it was okay. No, it's not. God's forgiven us. At no point has he said what we've done was okay. So if that's one of the barriers that stops you forgiving people, please, please understand that forgiving people doesn't mean you're saying what they did was right. You're just forgiving them because God forgave you. And if you're doing it with Kavanaugh, you're restoring them for the purpose of his kingdom.